Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watch Us Tonight Sans Intro. We've got a great show on the agenda. We have Steel Rolex Date Dates, Patek Fleet Pricing Logic, the best and the worst of 2018 to date, of course, viewer wrist shots, and the best article of the week. Rolling in. Okay, let me remind you who pays for these pixels. There's no better place online to buy, trade, and sell watches than thewatchbox.com. You can see my videos, world-class photography, full boxes, papers, accessories, and anything that we have listed is listed with a price. No mystery machines on thewatchbox.com. Okay, batting practice, warming up your monitor with your pitches and my cuts. Let's get started. We open with two questions that cut to the heart of the controversy surrounding exclusivity, production volumes, brand equity, and the balance between respect for the past and paying customers. So let's jump right in. Our friend from Belgium. DDAT asks, Tim, is it time for Rolex to offer a day date in stainless steel? As 2019 will be the 60th anniversary of the original pilot production Rolex day date in steel. That's a great question because, as you know, this would not be the first. For our viewers, that one's in platinum. But for our viewers, back in 1959, Rolex did a pilot run of six 6611 references, and they were the Date 8 in stainless steel. So those are worth a fortune today. Should Rolex revisit this? I'd say no. Let me qualify that. First things first, one must assume that if we did this and we went whole hog, then the logical pattern for this kind of transition would be the Yacht Master 2 and the Sky Dweller. And this is the thing. The Yachtmaster 2 launched in full gold in 2007 before becoming available as a full stainless steel watch for less than half the price in 2012. Now, the Sky Dweller took a similar but even more dramatic path from its Basel 2012 launch to the arrival of the mostly stainless steel Sky Dweller in 2017. Token white gold bezel notwithstanding, the steel gold Sky Dweller in 2017 was the steel Sky Dweller, and for a third the price of the original on full gold. So. The Day Date is an icon, though. This is different. This is not some Johnny Come Lately peripheral Rolex complication. This is core catalog. An icon, and there's over 60 years of model history here, running counter to the notion of a steel president, as we still call it lovingly. Any Day Date in full steel, let's play devil's advocate here and say, what would it take for this to happen? It would be a knife in the back to prior owners who paid the precious metal price and a serious breach of heritage in exchange for added volume that, frankly, Rolex doesn't require in these the best of times for the brand. So if a Date 8 in steel were to be executed, what would that be like? Well, it would have to be three things under three conditions. First, no full steel model. Go with the Sky Dweller precedent. Maintain a gold bezel, even a white gold fluted bezel, to protect the historical integrity of the model, as well as the unique position of those original six 6611s. You can't go home again, and I don't think Rolex should try. Now, it should also be extremely limited in production. There have only been three or four times when Rolex explicitly said, this is a limited production run, and I think a steel day date would be occasion for a fifth or sixth. I would also say you need to imagine the scarcity and legendary wait lists for the 1990s Zenith-powered Daytona and kind of raise that an order of magnitude. That has to be the baseline, the minimum for scarcity versus demand. And finally, no president bracelet. Create a unique product and offer assurances to clients who did pay for precious metal, especially those who paid in platinum. So this is why the current Rolex GMT Master Pepsi is being delivered on a Jubilee bracelet. It's to protect the white gold Pepsi guys who paid $40,000 to buy this watch, basically, on an Oyster bracelet with the exact same look. So this is protecting the guy who paid for gold. Rolex should do the same thing if it ever ventures into the realm of the steel day date. And besides, Historically, day dates have been available on most Rolex bracelets. Most Rolex bracelet options have at some point been available on the day date. So this would not be running counter to history. We've seen it on the Jubilee. We've seen it on the Oyster. We've even seen it on a yellow brick road model that's been offered scarcely anywhere else in Rolex history. So this has plenty of precedent. And besides, in 1959, the first time Rolex did a steel day date, they went with exactly that, an Oyster bracelet. So in 1959, Rolex laid down a mark. I think if Rolex does another steel day date, even a mostly steel day date, it can't be on the president bracelet. And you know what? That's okay. So Dinesh P asks about Patek Philippe. First, let me acknowledge my live audience. Amadigi joining us 
first. I can see Eddie Landsberg, Don Gizzle from Germany, Matt Foster, Ronnie Erickson, new to our chat box, Tom P, Russell996, Hale Bop, Regular of ours, Justin K, Long Mach, Andrew, and Thumper JDM, Philip, Sebastian, Peterson, guys, welcome. I appreciate Edward Ledden from Sweden and our entire cast of family and friends from around the world. So back to Dinesh's question. Hi, Tim. I'm an executive in the fashion design industry, and I'm determined to add a steel Patek Philippe. I want to add a steel Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711. Okay, the icon, the one that everyone wants. I want to add it to my small collection, and I have since I entered the industry. The March price hike by Patek Philippe seems like a knife to the back. It's the exact same watch, only now 25% more. I have the money. That's not an issue. But why should I pay a brand that demands a premium for an identical product, especially since there's a year-plus waiting list to begin with, and I might get hit by a second price hike even if I queue up at an AD? Am I misreading this, Tim, or should I just seek another option and be done with it? Okay. Dinesh, let me just say I know exactly where you're coming from because I was in the market for my JLC Dual Met in early 2014, and by the time I was ready to buy, I watched the recommended retail price jump $3,000 overnight. Granted, it was a jump from $50,000 to fifty three dollars and I didn't wind up paying anywhere near list, but with Patek going from about $24,000 U.S. to about $30,000 U.S. in March of this year, that's a huge percentage hike for a watch that is fundamentally unchanged. But let's consider this. We're talking about a model that's been on the market for 12 years, unchanged effectively since 2006, and whose movement, a non-hacking movement for that, has an architecture that dates back decades. It's pretty, but it's old tech, even with the silicon hairspring. So Patek's decision was shocking when viewed from afar. But I want you to consider a few factors that might make Patek's decision more understandable, and you might even agree with Terry Stern's logic by the end. So let's get started. This all began when Patek, like everyone else in the space, in the watch space, understood that people were paying $45,000 to $50,000 for barely used pre-owned 5711s in steel. The watch lightly used was selling for basically twice retail. Paddock, understandably, as the manufacturer of the watch, wanted to capture some of this value that was being lost to the secondary market. And 2015 to 2016, the abominable years for the watch industry and the implosion of the late 2000s are not easily forgotten by this highly cyclical industry and the people in it. Even the Stearns are subject to a luxury watch market in which you need to make your money when times are good and demand is strong. So there were five options that Patek could take, and I really believe they took the only one that was acceptable from a practical standpoint and with a view to respect for the client. So here's here's how it goes. First, Patek could do nothing, maintain current volume and pricing, and watch pre-owned sellers sell their watch for twice its retail price. Or dramatically increase production and drop the price. That's unrealistic because that inverse relationship between volume and value kills customers past and present. I would feel betrayed if I got on a one-year wait list and paid list at any price to see this happen to the value of my watch as volume goes up. So that's not realistic. Or Patek could have increased steel Nautilus production volume and price. That's the worst of all possible scenarios. Then your watch becomes less exclusive and it costs more if you're on the wait list. That's a total betrayal. Patek could have increased steel Nautilus production and held the line on price, which might be great if you're buying new, but from a business standpoint, that's Patek running itself out of business. Finally, there's the last and only truly understandable decision, which is maintain current production volumes and increase the price, which leaves us with the question, how much of a price increase is reasonable, if that is the option Patek takes? Well, keep in mind that secondary market prices proved to Patek that this watch was selling for too little money, and the Stearns chose an option that would not betray clients past, because they would see the value of their investment go up, or future, clients who would wait in line to get the watch, but be assured that it would still effectively be worth more used than they paid new. So, by keeping volume static, Patek keeps the faith with past and present and future owners. 
Here's what happens. As long as Patek's retail ask remains far below the secondary market price of the watch, we're, at, we're talking 30000 here, not 40, not 50. It's now a $30,000 watch. The Stearns are making a conscious choice to leave a ton of money on the table. They could have asked 40 and got it. They didn't. They could have asked 50 and probably got it and didn't. So, a true appraisal of an adaptation to the market would see the Nautilus priced at 50 grand US. And I can guarantee that any other watch brand, luxury group, or distributor besides maybe Rolex would have jumped at the chance to double the price of a product without adding a single Swiss franc of additional investment, and Patek did not do that. Therefore, I think Patek's move was the most moderate and upstanding possible, a 25% price increase when it could have been a 100% price increase, counts as a fair move by the Stearns. And I think history will be kind, and I think that if you get in line for this watch and take delivery a year from now, you will not regret it. So I'd say, Dinesh, let her rip. The price is still quite reasonable for what you get, and you're never going to think twice once the thing is actually on your wrist. That's usually the way. All right. Viewer wrist shots. Your pieces on these pixels. Let's start with Russell K, who met with Patek Philippe and placed an order of his own for his next big score. 5370p, split second, Breguet numerals in white gold, black enamel dial, scalloped case flanks, coaxial mono pusher style. Ratrapont trigger. Absolutely gorgeous. This is as good as it gets. That's the brass ring, my man. I am jealous, and I admire your choice. Okay, going big or going home. Aminta's N shares his 5960R, a different look for Patek, with flyback and annual calendar. So that's a lot of complication packed into a 40.5 millimeter case. Amentus, you wear it well. And I love the combination of rose gold with the white dial. That's a rarely seen variant. Okay, continuing on, old school. Mark, Mark D. rocks his blanc pain. Well, nope, not that. That's the oyster quartz. Mark D. rocks his blanc pain air command right there from the previous era before the current mill specs and ocean commitments of 40 millimeter blanc pain 50 fathoms. That was a great look and a very wearable watch with a flyback chronograph. Spectacular, timeless, as handsome today as it was in the late 90s. We jumped the gun, but good things come to those who wait. Ed H. is a man after my own heart, a watch I shouted out in the last episode, with his Oyster Quartz Date 8 in white gold. Get them while they last. 25,000 pieces over about 25 years, the majority of which were yellow gold and the date just. That blue dial white gold is arguably the coolest watch you're going to see on the show tonight. But I'm going to hold you in suspense, to use our president's favorite term. There might be better to come. Okay, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch right here on our features. And we come to tonight's primary feature. This is the big one, the best and worst watches of 2018 to date. Ours is a front-loaded industry. You see pre-SIHH stuff in October, November, December of the prior year. And then SIHH hits, and the Basel brands start releasing stuff during SIHH. Then you see pre-Basel stuff, and the SIHH brands show you stuff that they tease on the eve of Basel to steal Basel's thunder. And pretty much everything comes out at Basel, because let's face it, Swatch Group, Roll, Alex, LVMH, and Paddock. But here's the thing. We can now take stock of what's come and basically hand out the awards for the year because that's just the way our industry swings. So let's reflect on the best and the worst of 2018. Hits first. I'm going to award category size recognitions to the year's best. So category style, biggest surprise. I was thinking the IWC Paul Weber, but Richemont's done a jumping hour, jumping minute with Langa. The Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter limited edition in rose gold, titanium, and tantalum was a big surprise. Not because they chose to make this a special edition on an anniversary or it's 25 years since we saw the first Seamaster 300 meter divers, but because they chose to pay tribute to a relatively obscure tritone chronograph from the 1993 debut year, a watch I once called the perfect Bond watch for a Bond villain. So, an obscure version of a popular watch. Line. I love the logic, but there's more going on here. 2,500 pieces, 13,000 US dollars. I think this is going to be one of the few two tone, okay, tri tone watches that you can buy at list and expect to hold its value at list. I think it's going to be that popular. After watching the Spectre 300 meters hold their value, and that was a 7,007 piece in steel. 
That was a 7,007 piece limited edition. I think 2,500 of these will absolutely reward those who choose to go big and not go home. Miami Beach style, but I think it wears well anywhere. A timeless design, the longest legged of the Seamasters. Think of another Seamaster design that's lasted a quarter century. I can't. Finally, this thing could actually steal sales from Blancpain, the appointed purveyor of luxury dive watches at Swatch. Let the games begin. Okay, best dress watch. This one hits close to home because I seriously thought about buying it. A Longo Unzona Saxonia Thin Copper Blue. Okay, forget the triple split. This was the story of longest 2018. Take a good look at that. If we can go full screen, guys, I'd be much obliged. An emotional force of nature masquerading as a watch. That's what this copper blue is. A relentless torrent of power and grace from a brand that needs exactly this watch at exactly this moment. 39 millimeters in diameter by 6.2 millimeters thick in white gold. Solid silver dial with blue glass scattered with copper flakes. This is a sensation. Delicate, distinctive, so longa, and yet warmer and more approachable than its typical Teutonic style. For once, a longa caliber is not the highlight of the watch. Yeah, the caliber 093 is handsome and whatnot, but for once, I don't want to wear a longa upside down on my wrist, and that's a good thing. This is the new face of the brand. This could be longa's FP Journe Chronomet Bleu. It's sized to compete at 39. It's styled to compete without being derivative. And at 22,000 US dollars, it's priced within about 800 US bucks of Journe's heavy hitter, Longa. This thing needs to be the new flagship. If not by price, by beauty and stature. Please don't let this one get forgotten. Put some ad money into this. Your brand and your collectors and your fans will thank you. All right. Best co-branding. Here's one that's going to be a bit controversial. Roger Dubuis and Lamborghini. As Blancpain's 10-year shotgun marriage, awkward shotgun marriage, lurches toward divorce, were greeted by Lambo's surprisingly apropos new flame. The watches, like the cars, are brash and powered by no-holds-barred sybaretic arrogance. It's kind of Roger Dubuis' thing, but that's good because Lamborghini works the same way. The quality is there. No apologies are made. And Roger Dubuis, at least in terms of design and focus on its clientele and style, might be the single most driven and focused brand in the Richemont Labyrinth right now. 5,000 watches a year, and they're having no trouble selling them to the kind of guy who ordinarily would buy Richard Meal, which means they're right on target. And you need more evidence? Well, there's a region that outgoing Roger Dubuis, CEO Jean-Marc Pontrouet, was handpicked by Richemont Kaiser, Johann Rupert, to run Panerai, Rupert's favorite child, as the outgoing Angelo Bonatti retires in glory. The product from Dubuis right now, especially the Lamborghini line, is convincing. Geneva Hallmark, modern materials, outrageous size and style with no compromise in finish or watchmaking. These watches deserve your respect even if you don't love them. And now, the Dubuis partnership with Pirelli, which was puzzling at first as a standalone, makes far more sense as a supporting actor than the leading role it assumed just a few months ago. The Pirelli thing finally fits. Ultimately, Richard Meal is the target. But here's the thing. Dubuis is on track for a titanic clash with Richard. And I think they've actually got the guns to go head-to-head -head with this man and his best now. Dubuis has all of the sizzle and all of the stake. As I said earlier, let the games on wrist and track begin. Okay, best sports watch. It's tough to redo one watch. So Rolex gave us four. The Rolex GMT Master II, as a family, has to sweep this category because it manages to be almost everything to all people, and yet it does so with almost zero compromise. That is the toughest assignment in the watch business. Not retro watches or revival watches, because like the Porsche 911, they draw on a heritage that is continuous. There was never a break in this lineage, and thus the GMT Master sails into 2018 in sizzling form, arguably stronger than it's ever been, so they will be sold out, waitlisted, and coveted to no end, and that includes the precious metals in two-tone. So first ever use of rose gold on Rolex GMT. I predicted it pre-Basel, and it happened. 
First ever two-tone on a GMT involving rose gold, doubling up on the firsts, and the first ever use of a Pepsi bezel serochrome on steel. So the return of Rolex's traditional GMT Jubilee bracelet option is essentially the missing in action Rolex bracelet always offered, but not since 2008. It belongs on the revival of the Pepsi in steel. Also, it protects the buyers who paid 38 grand for the white gold Pepsi from 2014 to 2017, so Rolex is still doing well by its premium buyers and early adopters. Finally, it is hard to mess with success. Every brand fears updating a classic, generally takes no chances, and still comes up short. Rolex shot nothing but net from the three-point line, and if you're not familiar with idiomatic English-American expressions, that just means they tried something really hard and they executed perfectly. So that is my best sports watch as a family for 2018. Best movement from a brand we rarely discuss except as a supplier to other brands, including Richard Mille. This is the Parmigiani Fleurier Caliber PF365. 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates, you got it. 84 interior angles, the toughest assignment in watch movement finishing. If we can go full screen, guys. Laurent Ferrier gives you between one and six interior angles. Parmigiani gives you 84, immaculate. You want more? COSC chronometer. Vertical clutch column wheel tandem for chronograph actuation. 36,000 vibrations per hour, 65 hour power reserve. 50 pieces will be offered for $85,000 in the Kalpa Chronor. It's almost like you're paying 85 grand for the movement and they're throwing the watch in. And for a bare movement, it's still a bargain. This is the best movement of 2018. I'm calling it ahead of time. We don't have to wait for the end of the year. Person of the year, Angelo Bonatti of Panerai. The only chieftain Panerai has ever known under first Von Dome Cartier and later Richemont ownership, he leaves unbowed. This is more of a lifetime achievement award because we're collectively recognizing his accomplishments with one person of the year accolade. Consider this, 1997 to 2018, it's Angelo and no one. How many Richemont CEOs have come and gone at the watch brands since then? Uh, seriously, leaving entirely on his own terms, a Richemont CEO retiring happily is like a natural peaceful death on Game of Thrones. Pretty much. Consider how many heads have rolled at the Richemont Empire in the last three years alone. That might be too merciful a comparison. Finally, I just have to say, Arrivederci, Angelo, and thank you for the memories. And now, I bring you the misses. No, not them. The other misses. Sports watch. Okay, here is the first big miss of the year. Ulysse Nardin Diver Deep Dive. First, let me say, UN, I love you. You had a storming SIHH. Flinke enamel, guilloche dial, with a flying tourbillon, with a manufacture movement in steel for under 30 grand. They did that. The Freak Vision, a concept watch come to life. They did that too, only a year after the concept watch itself. And then finally, they had the Voyeur Classique, an exceptional automaton so X-rated, I don't even want to read their marketing copy off their website, but it was spectacular, rest assured. Google that one on your own time and not company time. But here's the thing, the 2000s are over US, UN and this watch feels like a stowaway from that era. Too large, too goofy, and with no disarming humor or irony in any, any redeeming fashion, at only 46 millimeters with an aquarium worth of fish graphics on the dial. Uh, this is a discrete sartorial option only at its max depth of 1,000 meters, but like a deep dwelling shark, it loses all physical form, grace, and purpose out of the water. And for $12,000, you could buy a Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller. So it's one of the few watches that actually looks less weird from the case back. And then it's still pretty, uh, well, not pretty. Okay, continuing on, event. Breitling Navitimer 8 debut. I can only speak to the US debut. I wasn't in Zurich, I wasn't in Shanghai. But I was there. Much money was spent rolling out the new line. Celebrities fell out of the rafters. And yes, Olivia Munn was a lot of fun to talk to. I had an interview where she was talking about a vintage Rolex that we couldn't use because she was talking about Rolex at a Breitling event. But even paying Hodinkee's Jack Forster to sell his soul for one night as MC, 
they didn't quite pull it off. I wasn't feeling it. Uh, the watches were all well made and handsome, but the Navitimer 8 was not the revolution that many feel Breitling needs at the moment. Uh, equity money, the arrival of Georges Kern, had set expectations impossibly high, perhaps too high, when those developments dropped in 2017. And I really think we need to give Georges Kern more time, because he had less than a year to launch an entirely new model line, and typical product cycles in the industry are usually three to four years. So on basically zero notice, this isn't bad, but it's not the revolution and the revelation that Breitling needs right now. I will say excellent updates of the original Navitimer range at Basel were much welcome. The black and blue steel Navitimer 01 B01 would have been my choice, and that's from a Breitling Navitimer purist's perspective. The new Breitling website is superb, immeasurably better than before, and I recommend you visit it. Also, the hardware scheduled for release in the fall, and I believe this will be the best of the year and the true sea change and the milestone moment, the watershed that Breitling needs. Wait for the fall, it's when the vintage tributes, true to size, with no date windows, in many colors, for many eras. 40s through the 70s are going to be dropping. I think the best is yet to come for Breitling. It just wasn't in February. Okay, finally, worst of co-branding the year so far. In March, Tag Heuer announced that it would become the official partner of Aston Martin Road Cars and of the new Vantage Aston Martin Racing Racing Cars. The car is cool, no doubt, and it's something of a favorite color for me. It's really more yellow-green in person. TAG stands to benefit. I think TAG is an immediate winner here because it's associating with an upmarket brand. The elephant in the room is Jajer LeCoultz's 10-year stint in the same role for Aston Martin and the bespoke Amvox complications that JLC developed during that decade. It's like me trying to follow John Oliver if you're watching this in tandem with HBO. I apologize in advance or after the fact. Either way, I can't follow that kind of crowd. And I think TAG is suffering by comparison to what came before from JLC. Now, the more accessible watches launched by TAG struggle against the JLC standards. Some of them are quartz, they're entry-level pricing. But I think the larger issue here is that there doesn't seem to be much Aston in these Aston-inspired TAGs. For now, the collection is handsome. It's value priced and you get a lot of watch for your money. It sticks to tag brand standards, but the current product feels indistinct from other existing tag watches. And I think that's the challenge out of the gate for this partnership. So in terms of co-branding, this one's not firing on all cylinders. Okay, industry news, coolest watch of the week. Like a camera decided to sell watches. Now, like a camera, AG, is Yep, that's the camera they make. It's a boutique brand in the camera space, so boutique optics. And they're pulling a reverse LeCoult as Jager LeCoult as LeCoult sold a micro camera during the late interwar period called the Compass, invented by Noel Pemberton Billing. They made about four to 5,000 of them, and it's a bit of a collector's piece for guys like me. But here's the thing. Leica wristwatches have finally arrived. Instead of a watchmaker making a camera, we have a camera maker making a watch. The L1 is a manual wind keep that graphic up, is a manual wine 41 millimeter steel or rose gold with a power reserve indicator, date, day-night indicator, and a 60-hour reserve. The L2 is all of the above with the addition of a rotating internal GMT-style bezel and a second time zone display. Both use a version of the Leica L1 caliber, so they do have a sort of in-house exclusive caliber for these watches, and it's a good-looking caliber. It's actually made for them by their manufacturing partner, which will be Lehman Precision out of the Black Forest, which is famed for making many things, including gummy bears and ultra-lightweight bike parts. But design was handled by existing Leica camera designer, Akim Heine, and it's good-looking. It's kind of Leica does nomos. Um, actual construction of the watches will take place under Leica's auspices at the new Ernst Leitz Staten. Prices appear to be set between about eleven and a half and twelve thousand and a half U.S. dollars. They're going to make about four hundred units to start, and they will be distributed through company Leica stores as well as watch vendors that are specialized watch vendors and authorized dealers. The steel version will be available as a special edition with a red dial, and I have to actually say I, I kind of dig it. It looks cool. The special edition with the red dial is definitely sharp, and again. It's a little bit of like it does nomos. I'll also say this. The guys are getting the hang of the watch industry because when you have a limited edition watch as a watchmaker in the luxury space, well, you make a million versions of it, and they're off to a good start. 
That said, this is not their first modern swipe at a Leica camera watch. The company's 2014 first effort with Valbray was big, ungainly, and perhaps a little bit too literally inspired by the iris of a Leica camera. Big, 7750 powered, and at 20 5,000 US dollars, probably overpriced. They made a hundred of these. Hopefully the new venture will have longer legs and smaller cases. Okay, best article of the week. I rarely toot my own horn up here. With best article of the week, I generally showcase the best article about a person, place, thing, product, or event in the industry. But this time, I have to tell you about the first truly new reboot, wholesale reboot of my watch reviews over on Watchbox Reviews since I rolled out my first one in August of 2014. F.P. Journe versus Chagere Le Coult. So it's a throwdown between two brands I love and two models I love in the Ultra Haute de Gamme Sports Chronograph segment. By the way, the link is in the description for those of you watching Open up a new window, open up a new tab, click that link, and you can go straight to the video. Professionally produced, this is a collaboration between me, Tim Masso, and the Watchbox Studios team. So this is the best of both. You don't see those guys, but you can see their quality in this versus episode too short. Now, what are you getting? Well, I would not tell you anything that wasn't worth your while, and most of what I do off-air is not worth your time, quite frankly. That said, this is a superb team effort that deserves attention to match, and with our new Versus series, we compare, contrast, and depict watches with in-depth commentary and imagery beyond anything we've ever featured in my traditional watch reviews. This is the Cadillac of watch reviews, now available alongside the old-school short takes that I still do. I'm not going to slow my production. Here's the thing. Four years of your suggestions, my own reflections, and popular demand have led us to this new format. And we maintain our identity and approachable personality, you're still going to see a human face and a human voice you know, while dramatically improving image quality and focus. It's still me, guys, but it's so much more. First, the approach starts with detailed specs, so you finally get a freeze frame of everything the watch does and is without me droning on about it. You can pause the frame and come back to it. The movement macros and the dial shots are world-class, courtesy of my team. That's the the Master Compressor Extreme, the JLC right there, and you're going to get the same level of attention to detail on the dial side. You also get much requested wrist shots from an angle that's pretty much head on, what I couldn't do from behind the camera when I was basically arcing around my SLR in the past, so you get a better sense of how the watch fits on a wrist you know so well. And ultimately, we're able to offer time-lapse loom shots for all watches with loom, and this looks the business. This might be the single best feature. The goal is a new episode every Sunday on Watchbox Reviews, so check out that link in the description. Check out our new comparison, FP Journe versus JLC, and please, in the comments below, let me know what you think. Finally, we go out with wrist shots, some of our best for last. John V proves that thinking outside the box has its rewards with his LU Chopard, the best Patek Philippe competitor that no one talks about. JS sends us a Seiko SBDX012 Marine Master and Leopard Upholstery from his excursion to Egypt. And Christopher C. sports a squally matic with a rather gorgeous turquoise dial. Entry-level diver, looking good. APH who goes by the handle its.clean on Instagram, modded his Omega, first Omega in space, replacing the alpha hands with pre-moon batons to turn his faux Wally Shira into a faux Ed White. APH, thank you. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And also, for our dog pound feature, the worst of watch listings, send me the worst listings, dishonest, Incorrect portrayal, flawed descriptions, or damaged watches that you find on the Bay and Chrono, so I can shame and name the worst of the web to improve the pre-owned space. Send those to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, too. Comment, if you haven't already, below, and subscribe, please. I'd really appreciate it. Until then, I'm Tim. They're the crew. This is Watches Tonight, and thank you for logging on.